Okay, we're going to get started. Seven o'clock. <clears throat> so this is our second class, and uh, I will be sharing the podium with my good friend Peter Kariva, who is one of the world's most distinguished ecologists. Um, did a lot of applied mathematics, so he brings quantitative measures also to ecology. And uh, Peter and I agreed that I'm going to talk about the Anthropocene and what it may mean to the natural world. And Peter is going to talk more about <coughs> the uh, environmental justice, equity, and other weighty issues. Is that right? Yeah. And uh, we agreed that I would go first. That way he can correct all my mistakes. <laughs> so, I, I won't have time. Well, yeah. <laughs> so these are a few of the takeaways from our first class. We need more affordable housing, and we need a public investment. Now, in the last few days, a lot has been happening with uh, affordable housing, but not with a public investment. We said that we needed to have incentives to move people into cities uh, and towns to curtail the spread and to conserve habitat. And we also need disincentives for housing in vulnerable areas, whether they're fire-prone areas, flood-prone areas, areas pr prone to mudslides, sea level rise. And the feeling was we need major investments in infrastructure going forward. Water, energy, wastewater. <clears throat> There's a lot of, of literature describing how bad the Anthropocene is going to be. And there's not very much literature about how we can make it better. And yet, we have much of the knowledge and the technology to make it better, much better. Some of you know Stuart Brand. He did the whole Earth catalog. Amazing man. Uh, he created a clock that will run for 10,000 years. Uh, he won't be around to see whether it makes it, but he's an amazing, amazing guy. And he made this statement a number of years ago, we are as gods, we might as well get good at it. I think there's a lot in that, because we created the Anthropocene, and we can make it better. Our technological advances are really quite amazing. Soon we won't have to be able, to, we won't have to drive our own cars, trucks, <coughs> airplanes, Robots are taking over cleaning hotel rooms in Dubai and other places. And uh, much of the more complicated surgery that takes place now is, is being done by robots. So when you look at the Anthropocene, I'm reminded of something John W. W. Gardner, he was former secretary of HEW under Lyndon Johnson, founder of Common Cause, and he was a professor at Stanford University. And he said, we are continually faced, that should be faced, with a series of great opportunities brilliantly disguised as insoluble problems. I think that captures much of the Anthropocene. We have the creativity and the innovation and the technology to make this a better Anthropocene. And there's California. I think California should be the leader for the United States and the world for, as a laboratory for designing, developing, testing, implementing, and refining strategies to thrive in the Anthropocene in terms of the kinds and amounts of energy we use, the ways we grow and harvest our food, both on land and in the ocean, and how we use our precious and limited fresh water, and how we can create a society in which a much larger part of our population has an opportunity to thrive. So let's look at climate quickly. 2018 was the fourth warmest year on record. The other three warmest years were 2015, 16, and 17. And if you look at the record that goes back about 100 years, it's clear that the Earth's average temperature is increasing. It's also clear sea level is rising and rising more rapidly <clears throat> than at any time in the past seven, 8,000 years. There was an interesting article in the LA Times today, and if you go to it, 
Um, you can find the, the paper that it was based on. It's a, it's a good one to take a look at. <clears throat> Coastal flooding is more frequent, and we have to distinguish between temporary periodic flooding and permanent inundation. They require different strategies. We're getting more and more what's called nuisance day or sunny day flooding. <clears throat> and California, worst fire year in its history. More than 1.2 million acres were burned, more than 1,200 structures destroyed, and nearly 100 lives were lost. If you look at tropical storms, if you combine the Atlantic and the Pacific, it was the most powerful tropical storm year on record. And drought, we've had a lot of rain. Some people say it's all over, we were out of the drought. Um, we're out of the drought maybe temporarily, but we live in an area of the United States where drought will always be with us. And while, there's n while you can't relate any single extreme weather-related event to climate change, it's clear that climate change increases the probability of having extreme weather-related events. 93% of the heat that's been added to the Earth since the Industrial Revolution has gone into the ocean. That bottom picture is a picture of the Scripps Pier in San Diego, La Jolla. And um, they've been going to the end of that pier, measuring the surface temperature in the ocean for 102 years. And <clears throat> In August of last year, they measured the highest temperature they had ever recorded, and it was almost 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Summer of 2018, for 85 straight days, air quality in the LA Basin fell below federal air quality standards. In June of 2018, there were only four days that had healthy air across the South Coast Basin. South Coast Basin spans Los Angeles, Orange, Riverside and San Bernardino counties. <clears throat> and in July, ozone levels violated federal health standards every day of July except July 31st. <clears throat> and this recent surge in, in uh, smog and, and ozone makes it very clear that this is going to be a big challenge because ozone is not discharged directly. It's formed by a chemical reaction from the, the gases emitted from cars, trucks, and, and so on. And Southern California traditionally has the nation's worst smog, and it fails to meet a series of federal ozone standards going all the way back to 1979. Now, air quality is better today than it has been, but it's a challenge. And the driver of all this is very clear. <clears throat> CO2 in the atmosphere, primarily from the burning of fossil fuels, but also from agriculture, from wetlands, <clears throat> and from <clears throat> uh, I guess land practices. In 2018, our fires contributed as much greenhouse gas to the atmosphere as the entire transportation sector did in 2018. And these, these trends have a lot of inertia. Do you remember this fortune cookie saying, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. Every day that goes by, the probability increases that we're going to end up where we are heading, and we will not like it. Doesn't mean it's inevitable. Professor Frank Fenner, who is an Australian, and he helped wipe out smallpox, he said humans will be extinct within 100 years. Stephen Hawking, who died a year, a little over a year ago, he said that we have fewer than 100 years to find and populate a new planet. That's not going to happen. <clears throat> not even Elon Musk can move nine to 10 billion people to a planet that has yet to be discovered. So we have only one alternative, and that is to create a new planet right here 
on earth. No more procrastination, no more dawdling. We need to get on, on with this. Einstein once mused, if at first an idea is not absurd, there is no hope for it. Now, a lot of Peter's ideas have been deemed absurd, right? <laughs> but there always was hope for them, and he has made enormous contributions. <coughs> the idea of creating a new planet right on, here on Earth, in some sense, it is absurd. But it's the only hope that we have, and, and I think that California should show the way on how to, to do that. So there are a few things that we know. The earth in California will be warmer. Wet areas will be wetter. Dry areas will be drier. The number, frequency, intensity, and duration of many extreme weather-related events will increase. Sea level will continue to rise. Population will be more urbanized. And population will continue to grow until mid-century and then will probably begin to decline. Now, that flies in the face of what many of us have bled led to believe, but I want to talk a little bit about population. <clears throat> you can see there's a lot of uncertainty. So the, these are world population out to 2100, and if you look at the, the green, at, at the low estimate, all the way up to the top, there's a lot of uncertainty. But there's a very important new book that's just out called The Empty Planet. <clears throat> and it's by Daryl Bricker and John Ibbotson. And it was published earlier this year. The world is becoming increasingly urbanized. <clears throat> and with increasing urbanization, and they estimate that by 2050, 80% of the world's population will live in cities. The fertility rate goes down as women get more independence and more opportunities. And urbanization offers opportunities for conservation. The fertility rate is defined as the number of children a woman will have <laughs> over her lifetime. And this is happening not just in the developed world, but it's also happening in developing countries. <clears throat> Some of you, from particularly uh, those from Stanford, remember <laughs> this book by the population bomb, and this is a statement from the opening section. The battle to feed humanity is over. In the 70s and 80s, hundreds of millions of people will starve to death in spite of any crash programs embarked on now. Well, the population doubled between 1950 and 2010. Food production went up by a factor of three, and it, 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 the, it only required a 30% increase in the land that was used for cultivations. <clears throat> so the predictions, I think, are <clears throat> that by mid-century, population will be stable and then will begin to decline. Now, you probably can't read these, although you have them in your, your notes. But wherever you see, if, at the top, it's, it's 1970, and at the bottom, it's 2014. And wherever you see blue, that means the fertility rate is close to replacement, which is 2.1 children per woman. So if you look down at the bottom one, pretty much the whole world is uh, decreasing. <clears throat> we, we know these countries are at or below replacement, and the first number in parentheses is 1960. And the second number is 2016. China went from 5.8 to 1.6. India from 5.9 to 2.3. US from 3.6 to 1.8. Canada, 3.8 to 1.6. Brazil goes down. Mexico, Malaysia, Thailand. <coughs> there still are some others that have high fertility rates. Niger, Malawi, Ghana, Af Afghanistan, Iraq, Egypt. But if you look at those two numbers, in every case, they also are having fewer children. <clears throat> and it, it, I think it's important that when, with urbanization, girls have more educational opportunities. 
Women have more professional opportunities. And when you lived in the countryside, having four or five children to help you in the field was an asset. In the city, having a lot of children is a liability. <clears throat> so, let's see. <clears throat> All right, so women gain power. It's interesting in, in this book, The Empty Planet, they also claim that once you move into cities, your relatives have less influence on you. They're not always saying, shouldn't you be having a, a child? Uh, organized religion has less influence on, on you. And the dominance of men goes down in the urban, urban settings. So globally, a lot of good things are happening. The, uh, our lifespans are increasing. Infant mortality is decreasing. The number of people living in abject poverty is declining. But all the while, quality of our environment, particularly our two commons, the atmosphere and the world ocean, they're declining. And all you have to do is look at what's happened to the atmosphere and to the ocean. So the challenge then <coughs> is first we have to halt and then reverse global warming. Climate has a, has a lot of inertia. This is an old friend of, of mine and probably Peter's, Wally Broker, distinguished geochemist. And he made the statement, climate is, climate is an angry beast and we are poking it with sticks. And I think that's a good characterization. The levels of CO2 in the atmosphere, they stay there for a long time. 50% stays there for decades, 30% for centuries, 20% for millennia. <clears throat> and if you look at this going from the, the present out here, back 400,000 years, that's the current level of CO2 in the atmosphere. Human beings came around about 200,000 years. We have never seen CO2 levels in the history of modern humans, homo sapiens, this high. And more greenhouse gases keep coming. We had Paris in 2015, we had Poland in 2018, calling for nations to make significant cuts in greenhouse gas emissions. And these were important meetings. But the problem is these commitments have no teeth. <clears throat> There's no authority if they aren't fulfilled. And they are not being fulfilled. In 2017 and 2018, after these meetings, global emissions went up. And in 2018, our emissions in the United States went up by 3.6%. <clears throat> so <clears throat> if you've extended this back <clears throat> to the geologic epoch called the Pliocene, <clears throat> which was somewhere between four and four and a half, for three to three to five million years ago, there was CO2 in the atmosphere as high as it is today. And in the Pliocene, CO2 levels were actually twice today. Average temperatures were five to seven degrees higher, Fahrenheit. And sea level in the Pliocene was 130 feet higher than today. So this has happened before in geologic time just not in our experience. Now, three to five million years ago, early hominids, our other forms of humans, but not modern humans, they did exist. And uh, <clears throat> so they, they uh, would have experienced some of this, but none of us ever has. So <clears throat> our actions have created us to, committed us to a warmer Earth and all that goes with it, well beyond the end of this century, unless we have active intervention. And we, until recently, we were the largest contributor of greenhouse gases to the atmosphere. China is, is now. <clears throat> so it's very clear. We have to move away from fossil fuels. <clears throat> and uh, we have to do this globally. How many of you were at the lecture? last night or watched it. So a few of you, it was, very, it was a very good 
lecture on how to have rapid global decarbonization. <clears throat> and in California, you know, we have the fifth largest economy in the world. We contribute, though, only about 5% of greenhouse gas em emissions. And the mixing time in the atmosphere is about a year. So what California does doesn't amount to very much. We all have one atmosphere. We're immersed in it. And that's why it's got to be a global program. And uh, some of you may be thinking, well, here in California, we're showing the way we have an enviable record of switching to, <coughs> from fossil fuels to renewables. That's in the electric sector. That's about one third of our total energy use in California. Another third comes from heating and cooling our, our buildings. And another third, or maybe a little more, from transportation. And this doesn't even include agriculture, which is conveniently left out. When the sun goes down and the sun isn't shining, we in California import a significant amount of energy. Some of it comes from the Northwest, where it's hydroelectric, so that's renewable and clean. But we also import electrical energy from Nevada and Arizona, and it's generated by fossil fuels and by nuclear, but there's not much said about that. <clears throat> California's goal is 100% clean by 2045. And clean now includes renewables. Includes, it, it includes also, though, nuclear. And um, <clears throat> we've shut down one of our two nuclear plants. The other one, Diablo Canyon, is scheduled to be shut down early in 2025. And we still will be faced with how do you maintain baseload? It's not during the daytime, it's at night. And we will continue to have to import our energy unless we bring on some, some like more nuclear. We're going in the, the wrong direction. Storage, batteries. Store it up during the day when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. There are no battery technologies on the horizon that would be able to do this at a large enough scale. <clears throat> and I think if, if you look at all the facts, the way our speaker did last night, <clears throat> and he concluded that the safest form of clean, renewable energy is the fourth generation nuclear. It also has a, a strong advantage is that it has the highest energy density. That means you don't need to take a lot of the landscape and you can leave more of the landscape to nature. And we still get concerned about what do we do with, with the wastes. And if you look at what we, we do with coal waste, and when you think about the tens of thousands of solar panels that have a lifetime of 20 to 25 years. They are filled with hazardous materials. We have no idea of where we're gonna, going to store those. So, <clears throat> agriculture. California has the largest agricultural economy of any state in the United States. Twice number two, Iowa. Three times number three, Texas. <clears throat> and we feed much of the US with our fruits and vegetables and even other parts of the world. But agriculture takes a big toll on California. 70% of our developed water, 25% of our land surface. It creates dead zones in, in the ocean and it emits somewhere between a fourth and a third of all of the state's greenhouse gases. So I think we do dumb things. I think dismantling our nuclear plants is a dumb thing. I think by not dealing with the amount of water that goes to agriculture, we're doing a, a dumb thing. There's a wonderful new book called The Water Paradox, and he analyzes the water situation globally and in California. And he says that when it comes to agriculture, 
and water in California, we are more like a developing country than a developed country. <clears throat> and the speaker last night pointed out that it was, his analysis showed that the only way for rapid decarbonization globally was to build lots more of the fourth generation nuclear pet plants. And he used as the example Sweden um, and France both, and, and Finland is the poster child for how to dispose of waste. There are other reasons, though, we need to focus on agriculture if we want to thrive. Many crops that we now grow won't do very well by the end of this century when temperature increases and water is in shorter supply. Fruits and, and vegetables particularly. Many fruits require chill nights, and the, the nighttime temperatures are going up more rapidly than daytime temperatures. So we need to adapt. We need to begin to develop new varieties or even new, new species. And I think we have to reduce the amount of land that we devote to high water demanding crops that are of low value. Alfalfa, cotton, rice. Should we be growing those crops in a climate like this? So here, if you probably can't read these numbers. Alfalfa is at the top. So just look at those as the, the amount of water required. Almonds also take a lot. Almonds, though, are a very high value crop, and 90% of all the almonds grown in the United States are grown here in California. Pasture, rice, trees, fruits and, and nuts, corn, lettuce, broccoli. I don't know that any of us would miss broccoli. If it went away, maybe some would. <laughs> I know it's good for you. It's good for you. OK. <clears throat> Alfalfa, last year we used billions of gallons of water to grow alfalfa. It was enough to satisfy the needs of a million California families for an entire year, and much of it was used to feed our, our own five million cattle, and much of it was exported to China. So there, and it's a wonderful, beautiful crop. Exporting to water, water to China is nuts. <coughs> Maybe. Um, <clears throat> cows. We have 1.5 billion cattle worldwide. Brazil, India, China lead. We have 94 million, almost 100 million now in the, in the United States. And in California, we have 5 million cattle. There's, a, there's an interesting article on how to decarbonize America and the world. And it was written by Ramez Nam. And in the paper, he says, cows should scare you more than coal. <laughs> that may be an exaggeration, but we underestimate what cows do to this state and this planet. So maybe in California, we should weigh the idea of shifting some of our animal protein production from the land to the ocean and farm the ocean. It would be a healthier source of protein. Doesn't take any land, doesn't take any fresh water except a little bit during processing. Much lower emissions of greenhouse gas emissions. <clears throat> hmm? No, no, I don't, I don't want... No, I say get rid of some of those cows. <laughs> Replace them with fish. <clears throat> so, and you're going to hear a lot more about that next week from Kim Thompson, who's sitting in the back. So, and that's one of the modern aquaculture cages that are, are in use. But are we toast? <laughs> my, my friend Bill Patzer says we're toast. We may be. But are we burnt toast or are we light brown toast? <laughs> we, we have our hand on the thermostat, and I think we can get this back within bounds if we use the knowledge and the technology we have. I think we also are going to have to remove some of the CO2 already in the atmosphere and lock it away. Now, this gets a, a bad rap because it's geoengineering. 
I prefer to think of it as a serious pollution problem in the atmosphere that we've created over the last 200 years, and now we're going to have to clean up that pollution problems. <clears throat> we've been engineering the atmosphere and our climate for 200 years without any purpose, forethought. Why not think about doing it in, as the way Stuart Brand said, we are as gods, let's get good at it. And I'm not a big fan of what's called SRM, solar radiation management, where you inject small particles into the upper atmosphere. But I am a, a fan of the potential of carbon CDR, carbon dioxide removal. And Peter has a postdoc who's working on geoengineering. None of, none of, the, none of the strategies to date are affordable, and they're not scalable yet. But we should invest in this, I think, just in case. There was an interesting article that came out this week if we're in, in, on a in a laboratory setting that could scrub CO2 from the emission stacks of a, of a fossil-based power plant and convert it to solid carbon, coal. And you put the coal back in the ground. It's ironic. And it's not scalable at this point. But <clears throat> maybe it will be. OK, <clears throat> so there's our carbon dioxide removal. You can do it with plants. You can do it with technologies. And uh, I don't know, if Peter, you're going to say anything about CDR? Yeah. OK, I'll leave that. So water. <clears throat> OK, so in addition to moving away from high water demanding crops uh, and moving some of our animal protein from the land to the ocean, Let's look at some of the other factors. And if I get this wrong, Kevin Waddy, you're in the back, won't let me get away with it. <clears throat> he, he gave you a good description last week about water fix. <clears throat> so we have, we have three options. We can stretch the supply. We can augment the supply. So stretching it is through conservation, and we should do all of that. We can augment the supply, capturing Stormwater runoff, wastewater runoff, treating it, putting it back into the groundwater. It's not possible in lots of places in California because of the geology. And we can reallocate the supply. And reallocation would mean we would have to take some of the water away from agriculture. That's not an easy thing to do. <clears throat> San Francisco Bay. And this is, is the delta. It's a curious delta because most deltas around the world are at the ocean end, like the Mississippi. This one is the largest inland delta in the United States, not the largest in, in the world. And this is the place where <clears throat> there's another view of the delta, all of this, this area. And we've heavily modified it over the last couple of hundred years for, for a water system. We have also do a lot of farming there, and a lot of people live there. And many of them live 20 feet below sea level. <clears throat> and the, the, that whole delta is vulnerable to sea level rise or to earthquakes. This is one of those levees that was broken through. <clears throat> and if, if seawater rushes in to the delta, we could lose one of our ma two major sources of fresh water for, for months to several years. <clears throat> and there are 1,000 miles of these kinds of uh, uh, earthen jetties, the same kind that were in New Orleans before Katrina. We're, we're very vulnerable. So <clears throat> California water fix, Kevin gave you a very good description. So the idea is to dig one or two tunnels to take water out before it gets into the delta and deliver it on to the south of the delta. Price tag of seven to seven and a half billion dollars per tunnel. And um, the, the governor has committed to building one, one tunnel. <coughs> and there's another schematic showing this. And this is a reincarnation 
of what used to be called the peripheral canal. When I first started working in San Francisco Bay, the idea was to build a canal that would come out here so it would avoid the delta. This one goes under the delta. Clay Christensen, amazing person at the Harvard Business School. <clears throat> and in the prosperity paradox, he points out that innovation is the driver of creating new jobs. And jobs are the key to prosperity, particularly jobs that develop new products or create new services that open up new markets. And in California, we have these wonderful crucibles of creativity and innovation, innovation in high tech, in media, in medicine, but I don't think we have it in, in the environment. We may have the creativity, but creativity is not the same as innovation. Innovation is when you put the creativity into practice. <clears throat> he, he is famous for another thing. His son was a basketball star at Duke University a number of years ago. Clay is six foot seven inches tall. I think his son was 6'10". So, sea level rise. <clears throat> see, it's accelerating and it will continue. We're committed to a higher sea level. The amount of sea level rise is a function of how much and how rapidly redu we reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Sunny day flooding will increase in frequency, and flooding is not the same as inundation. One is temporary, the other is permanent. In Long Beach, I think we have a few decades uh, before places on the peninsula, and in Naples, they'll have no choice but to retreat. That's not easy in those areas. There's no place to go. On the peninsula, the highest elevation, I think, is seven feet. <clears throat> Doug, what's your elevation? One, one inch. <laughs> uh, so <coughs> this, is, this is sea level rise starting back at the end of the last glacial, the Pleistocene, and you can see it rose rapidly up until about seven or 8,000 years ago. And then it got flat. And it didn't in increase very much up until a, about 100 years ago. And it was during this period when it was flat, that's when there was this mass migration to the coast. And uh, because it was nice being close to the ocean, you had cool breezes, you had wonderful vistas. Um, but now sea level is rising, and that's the most recent increase in the rise of, of sea level. <clears throat> and it obviously is because of the greenhouse gas <coughs> emissions. <coughs> So Tom Lehrer said, always predict the worst and you will be hailed as a prophet. So I'm giving you some of the bad news and then Peter can come up and tell you everything is fine. <laughs> so the big 200, the big 800 pound gorillas are Greenland. If it were to melt entirely, it would raise sea level by 20 feet. And if Antarctic were to melt, sea level would go up 200 feet. Now that would take thousands of years but it has happened before, not in human history, but in the Pliocene, and it has happened before. <clears throat> this is going to be an increasing phenomenon. <clears throat> so energy, we love our renewables. Look at the amount of space these wind farms take up. They're renewable. They have very low energy density. And look at those vast expanses of solar farms. That does not mean that they're bad, but I think it does mean we have to be thinking about uh, what we're, <coughs> we're going to do. And now is the time to start to do that. And there was a very important article in Nature magazine on the 5th of December. And the authors said, things are going to happen faster than we think for three reasons. 
Greenhouse gas emissions are still rising. Air quality is improving. Air quality, as it improves, more solar radiation gets to the Earth's surface. It gets absorbed and gets re-radiated as long-term, long-wave radiation and can't escape. And we're entering a warm period in the Pacific decadal oscillation. We've been in a cold period. So my takeaway message is you can lead a human to knowledge, but you can't make him think. And my prescription, we, we shouldn't shut down Diablo Canyon. Where's Bob Grove? Bob used to work for Southern California Edison. Um, I think we need to move some animal protein production from land to ocean, reduce high water demanding crops, replace lawns with drought tolerant vegetation in Southern California, in, develop an integrated program of sustainable aquaculture and sustainable mariculture. Neither one of these alone will feed the population, but together they could. We need to develop better mechanisms to integrate science into policy making in California. We have an amazing state with enormous, the best colleges and universities, public and private in the United States. But the mechanisms to insert advances in knowledge into the policy making progress are impaired. <clears throat> we need to lower the barriers to entry into the good life in California, particularly the cost of housing. We need to increase funding for K-12 education. We rank somewhere between 21st and 46th, and it all depends on what metric you choose. And we need to relax permitting red tape. And we need, I think, to control government by proposition. It's gotten to be a big business in California, and if you have enough money, you can get a proposition on the ballot. And if you're clever enough, you can word it so you, the people who vote on it don't know if they're voting for it or against it. And um, we, we borrowed this model from Switzerland, where they do one or two of these, maybe every year or two. We have dozens of them. Jerry didn't give you my biography, and you sort of know his biography, but I want to tell you how they intersect. We both served on the NOAA Science Advisory Board, and my single greatest accomplishment is I kept Jerry from ruining NOAA. <laughs> okay, so that's where they intersect. So I'm, you know, I, I, um, Jerry ended with this point about how we have all this innovation in California, in technology, in Silicon Valley, in education, but lamented that we didn't seem to have it in the environment. And I, I hate to do this, but I agree with you. Um, and I'm going to tell a little story before I move, I move to it. I was recently, in, one of my jobs was to work for NOAA, and I was brought in to work to NOAA to do conservation on the West Coast for fish, but one of the big fields was salmon, obviously, because there are several stocks listed as endangered, and they intersect a lot of economic activity, uh, one of them being the dams in the Snake River, hydroelectric uh, dams, which are, are great clean energy. They're also unique in that you could, is the dams could go from zero to full power, you know, in like in seconds. You can't even, you can't fire up, you know, uh, natural gas when you so they're really good for mixing with renewables. Um, so I was brought in uh, to deal with that issue. And I wrote a, I wrote a paper, and, and it got covered in the New York Times like this. And, and basically, when we did the analysis, uh, there had been so much science done on salmon. There was, at the time that I was there, over a five-year period, they spent $250 million on science. I mean, this went to you know, faculty to do research on salmon. This was not restoration, this was not engineering, it was on science. So, you, so for a number of these things, you had extraordinary data. You, ne you just never saw data like this anywhere else. Did this analysis and concluded that really the, the story about the dams and removing them, uh, saving salmon was, it, it just didn't have any support. It's not because dams are great for the environment, it's because they'd also spent billions of dollars re-engineering the dam. And these are very special dams on the Snake River. They're not your normal dam. Um, and before I had gotten there, 
This was a full-page New York Times ad. And it was endorsed by pretty much every environmental group. I was on the board of the Nature Conservancy then, and they asked me if they should sign on, and I said no. And they didn't. Uh, but you'll know the ad says, if the dams are not removed now, these salmon will be extinct in 2017. Well, it's beyond 2017. It didn't, it didn't say maybe. It didn't say high probability. It just said with certainty. Uh, so I just got the dams have resurfaced. And then now resurfaced, not with respect to salmon. It's still salmon, but orcas. And I was asked to go up to speak by the Washington uh, Policy Group about dams and salmon and addressing these environmental problems. And I reimmersed myself after being away from it for 15 years. And I was just struck by had not changed. They hadn't, I mean, nothing had changed in terms of how they talked about it, how they analyzed the data, or so you talk about lack of innovation in the environment. And everything was pitched black and white, uh, not even recognizing it's a whole system. It's not just dams, it's irrigation, it's hydropower, it's shipping. You know, it, it's, a, it's a complicated system, and they were still using these same weird terms that had to be made up, differential delayed mortality. You look that one up sometime. That's actually one of the things, because they can't, couldn't measure it, so they, they created this term. And so this is how not to have a good Anthropocene. To, in 15 years, had made no progress so that I was, actually, I was stunned. I shouldn't have been an expert, but I was an expert. I went back up there. And I first, you know, slowly had this mind shift because even before that, I had been involved with the Spotted Owl Trials, which is another iconic environmental battle. And I was for the Sierra Defense Legal Fund. I was, I was an eco hero. And I remember those so well because I'd sit there, uh, you know, in those days, I could sit in a lotus position. I had Birkenstocks, I had the whole uniform. And, um, and I remember that the loggers in the back of the, of, the, of the courtroom, you can't disturb, it's a federal courthouse, but they, would have their, they had their kids on their shoulders. And they, uh, on a few, there was political theater. They do this with their kids. You know, you're, when you're, there's an age when your kids, you carry them like this and you hold their ankles. They do that. And the kids would cry. And you turn around and they had a sign that said, you care more about owls than feeding our children. Now, it was pure political theater. I get it. But it just so happened that my kids were exactly that age, so it kind of worked on me. Um, and it just made me think that, you know, the, um, the, when environmentalists have painted themselves into this sort of narrative about environment versus jobs, um, they're, they're not being really smart. Yeah. It's just not a good narrative to uh, paint yourself into. And uh, if any of you are teachers, I encourage you to do this, quote, this exercise. So I've started doing it. And every time I teach, they teach conservation classes and environment classes. So one of my favorite things, when I first get to know the students, I say, um, what's the most successful, what's the, what's the greatest success that you could recount for, um, for the environmental movement or environmental justice or the environment or conservation? And inevitably, it's either something they stopped or something they shut down. It's never something they created. Try that on, try, I mean, just try it on your students. And ask them, what is, what's a good success story for the environmental movement or anything, and see what they say. It'll be that they shut down the dams or a nuclear plant, or it'll be something they stopped. No, it's okay. I'm not saying, the, there are many reasons why doing that makes sense and is a smart environmental thing. But you think there would be at least one or two examples out there of something they created. So I encourage you. I realize now I've been doing this for so, for so many years, I wished I had taken data because I could publish this. Um, because, because I think it is true. I mean, I think it's, it, it, it really holds up to asking what we're teaching. You know, say no to GMOs. Say the planet, kill yourself. That's a little extreme. Um, so. Uh, so what can we do? Well, one thing is restoration. And I want to bring up restoration. We don't tell that story enough. This is in Korea, it, it, it's Seoul, Korea. If the, 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 the um, black and white picture there is 
you know, a freeway that goes through the center, and then they surface the river. And the river is, is incredible. It's really, really popular. Birds, you know, uh, 100 species of uh, birds in different parts of the river, insects, fish, and it's just rejuvenating. They're resurfacing rivers all over the place. Yonkers, I have a friend who works for an NGO in Yonkers. Uh, the river there is, that they resurface has just restored the downtown. Um, and I got this notion of thinking about restoration because one of my research projects was Mount St. Helens. And um, th this is what Mount St. Helens, right after it blasted, as a very young me, this is the first plant there on the left. I mean, it was so barren. We called it the Pumice Plains. There was one little lupin. And you'd have like 20 scientists circling around it, studying it. I mean, literally, you know, or somebody doing his genes and all of that. But just, we really saw the first plant back. Mount St. Helens, when it erupted, was like several hydrogen bombs. And now, this is, this is actually eight years ago, and, and it's just, you know, it's just rejuvenated. And it just makes you think about the restorative power of nature. Um, this is uh, Pittsburgh. Did anybody recognize that? My, my father was, he was a very nice man, but on one vacation, he took us to Pittsburgh. <laughs> um, and what, you know, when I went, I mean, it was just nobody went near the river. Now there's bass fishing. You know, I mean, Pittsburgh, the three rivers, there's a park there. There's a running trail al along it. It's an amazing story. Um, you know, this is the Bikini Atoll, which just vaporized everything. It's a, it's a pretty horrible story because we miscalculated that bomb and, and we killed some fishermen. I mean, the physicists made an error. But the coral, it's not like I'm going to go eat the fish there or anything, but the coral, has, a lot of the coral, the species have come back. Uh, just Yellowstone. You know, again, it's classic family vacation. You're in a station wagon, and we are East Coasters, and you drive across the, co the country um, and stop at the great national parks. The, there was no chance of, of buffalo or wolves or grizzly bears. I mean, no chance of it. There wasn't even a whisper that they might ever be there. You go to Yellowstone now, and, you know, the buffalo population, well, it's thriving there. It's, it's absolutely thriving. So, um, so restoration is a powerful thing. It's also, when we were at Nature Conservancy, um, the science had shown that for, uh, for a variety of, of, of bad actions by the oil industry and, uh, and development, we had lost the marshes and the oyster reefs. And so you could restore them, but it's an incredibly labor-intensive process to restore them. Now, uh, we, there, there's no robots, Jerry, to go out and restore an oyster reef. And we, said, we, we created a volunteer program, and we were stunned. We, we created a volunteer program we, that were overwhelmed. We couldn't handle them, because so many people wanted to get out and do something. And it, it, it was more than just restoration. It was actually community building. And it, it sort of empowered them to feel different, that they could take action. And it's, and it's real action. I mean, oyster reefs are, is, is real action. Um, and we didn't even realize this. We weren't uh, intending to see this, but one of the scientists noticed from Google Earth that the, re the restoration are those, um, uh, you see those, they look, those long rectangles there? That's oyster reefs that you, you put out there on cinder blocks. And behind it, then the marsh starts rebuilding, and you can see it from Google Earth. So it's actually rebuilding. The oyster reefs are, are cutting down on the erosion, and so the marshes rebuild. There's even ideas that there's some golf courses being lost that it can protect their thing. But th so here's a community action that can be seen from Google Earth, and it's doing something. And it's doing something substantive. Um, it increases jobs, the fisheries. So we got lots of support, community support, sort of thanking us for this. So restoration is a big deal. And we don't talk about it enough, but the Anthropocene is going to be a period of restoration. It absolutely is. And you know this I mean, because of the LA River, right? I mean, just think about LA River as this is just one of the renderings of it. And it's a debate, and it's fractious, and you don't know what it's going to do. But in 100 years, the LA River will be restored. 
And it will totally transform the city. It will totally transform the city. Um, and this can go on a lot of places. Another narrative is how fragile the planet is. I hate this narrative. I know this may offend some of you, but really, you, you know, this, like, the planet, the, vic the victim, they haven't heard about evolution and response. Yes, we drive species extinct. Yes, we do damage. But it's not quite as fragile as we paint it out to be. I, some of my favorite examples, there's new species being created all the time. I, I mean, admit it's not, you know, like, saber-toothed tiger, but there's a new species of mosquito that just lives in the London underground. Isn't that kind of cool? And just, a, you know, in 30 or 40 years. Um, you know, there's a hybrid wolf, I mean, a hybrid uh, coyote. We don't have them out here on the West Coast, but on the East Coast, they're much bigger and bigger jaws. Could take down deer, and sadly, they've taken down a jogger. But um, that's innovative. And uh, th it's one of my favorite, although now they're going to exterminate it because it does do damage. There's an island in, in, in uh, the Atlantic, the Gulf Island, and um, ships had put in there, and apparently a house mouse, just an ordinary house mouse, got off on the island. And it's a big breeding bird colony, like albatrosses. And this little baby house mouse has evolved in less than 100 years to be this, you know, vicious carnivore you can make a horror movie out of. Double its size and just, you know, just, just wipes out things. Now, that's a bad story about invasive species. I get that. But it's also a story about how inventive nature is. So I don't like that. Now, this is the real heart of, of the, of the, of the um, talk. Is so, so we can restore nature. Not to exactly as it is, but if we put the effort in, and it's a great community effort, it's great community, you can do it, you can see it, and you can feel the benefits of it. And we should want to do it. Because we all love nature. We don't, you might not realize it, but um, there, there's something deep there that we could tap. And we haven't done enough of it. There's hints of it. I mean, there's been books read. E.O. Wilson wrote Biophilia. The San Diego journalist wrote Last Child in the Woods and formed his own sort of organization that still exists. There's this notion of nature deficit disorder. So there was this feeling out there with actually not too much science um, where this, where this idea that we need nature and having nature makes us somehow happier and healthier. Um, you know, we, we, for 200,000 years, this is us. And now, now we're different, but I, I kind of think of myself like this. So. Um, the, the, the power of nature is not that new an idea. Um, the, the sort of gardens in hospitals and in abbeys and religious things had gardens, and it were very self-consciously that those gardens were places where people found peace and felt better. I mean, it was writing about it. It wasn't just John Muir. You know, the architecture was about that. You may have heard uh, in, in Japan they have a notion called forest bathing. So you go into the forest, and it just sort of cleans your mind. Um, this is a very famous study, kind of ad hoc, published in an obscure way, but you, it's talked about in, in biophilia, and it's talked about in Last Child in the Woods. It's just, it's just in the same hospital for the same surgery, some patients looked out on trees, and some patients looked out on a, on a brick wall, and uh, they got out of the hospital earlier if they looked out on trees. They also didn't take as much painkiller. So that's, it's, that's kind of cute, not real compelling, but there's starting to be evidence. Uh, this is from an article in New Yorker in Toronto, although this wasn't a direct health assessment. It was sort of a self-report, you know, so what do you feel like? And people felt better, and how much they felt better was like taking seven years off their life if they had more trees. And they lived in a city. Still not real strong science, but it's getting there. The first serious science was, a, was an experiment done in Germany, and they, they took students, mainly college students, who had spent at least 15 years in one of these three environments, either totally rural, village, or city. And then 
So that's the treatment. They grew up in different towns that correspond to different nature, and then they stressed them. How'd they stress them? They gave them a math test with a time limit, and they sat there and said, you know, um, you only have a few minutes left. And then they measured their cortisol and their brain and all that stuff. And they found, in fact, that the, the, um, the uh, students from the rural area handled stress better than the students from the city. Now, this is also, I mean, if you're a good experimentalist, if you're a good scientist, you realize this isn't so great either. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it, it, it's not so great because there's so much other stuff going on, you know. I mean, it, it's, it's not just nature. There's, there's so much cult, there's so much other stuff going on. It did get published in a very prestigious journal, it got published in nature. Um, now, I'm not going to show you all the data, but that, this is basically it, you know, you're taking a test, you're screaming at them, and then you measure stuff in their brain, and, and you produce graphs, and you see an effect of where they came from. Um, I was on a PhD committee as advisor for a student at Stanford who took it to the next level. He's now on the faculty at the University of Washington. His name is Greg Brotman. And he asked, he, so he got, he got it better. He cranked up the science, so to speak. And, and uh, if those of you who know Palo Alto, his treatments were a walk or a walk plus nature. The walk was a walk down El Camino uh, Real in, in Palo Alto. The walk in nature was the dish. You know, at, at, at Stanford, there's the, the park and the dish at the top of it. It's a run. So it, that was the walk. So it's the same length walk, only one is in the park-like and one is along El Camino. And he did before and after measurements of their cognitive ability and some of their, their psychological self-reporting. And he got a big effect. Um, so he did cognitive tests, 50-minute walk, nature or urban. Now, the urban was not... I mean, Palo Alto street is, is not like the streets I grew up on, so, but, but still, and then retested. Um, and what he found was that the effect of the nature walk was anxiety, rumination, and negativity went down. Those, are, those might sound mild to you, but those are the precursors to depression. So rumination is like, oh, I, um, you know, I should have said thank you, or I should have, you know, told my partner that I loved her or him before I left for work. It's, you know, so re regrets. And I think you all know what anxiety and negativity. Those are precursors to depression. They went down and in terms of the cognitive performance, mathematics and memory improved. Okay. But even that's not, you know, that's not perfect. But the students were randomized. So you're, you're, it's the same population. It's not like kids who grow up in a small town kids who grew up in rural and kids who grew up in a city, those are not randomized populations. This is the same population exposed to two different treatments. It, you couldn't think of it if it, you were testing a drug, you know, for an effect. It's, it's sort of done in that spirit. Um, you know, I was on this committee and I really, we really grilled them because I said, you know, well, how do you know it's nature? You know, I like to cook. And if I spent 50 minutes cooking, as opposed to taking a walk in nature, it just means that people could find ways to sort of take themselves off out of their world. It doesn't have to be nature. So it, it still wasn't quite what we wanted, but you know, this has got a lot of attention. He's several papers published. He's still doing that work. Uh, and it's also interesting for political. Uh, at the worst time possible at the Nature Conservancy, we tried to get a ballot measure passed in Alabama to put money into buying land for conservation. And when we first took polling, it looked like 75% were against it. It was the middle of the recession. And we flipped it from 75 against it to 75% for it. I'm, and we sent out these big, I meant to gather them and I rushed here so fast I couldn't get, I saw the postcard. There were big postcards we sent. But I want to look at the images on our postcard that we sent out, joy. We didn't say biodiversity conservation. This is joy in nature. I'll do this one. Joy in nature. And we flipped it. And we outperformed Romney um, uh, in, in that election in terms of money to buy land for traditional conservation. And it just, I say this as political because it just reinforces the sense that I think 
it's not a partisan, it's not a Republican Democrat thing. People have a sense of this. But now, this study was just published last week. So I have to talk about it because I, I just sort of blew my mind at how good this study is. This is the best one by an order of magnitude. Um, so the sample size is about a million. Not bad, huh? And what they did was they took, as soon as they were born, so they have really good records in Denmark, so they know from the age of birth to 10 where you lived. And then they quantified the grain right around your residence. And it's like 100 feet. It's really, you know, sort of the, the greenness. They did it by satellite imagery. Uh, it's basically a measure, it's called NDVI, but it's basically a measure of, of, of greenness and chlorophyll. So they, they quantified that as a dose response, and they looked then at adolescent psychological problems. You see, I mean, that's a good study because they did everybody. There was no selectivity. It was everybody from a birth to age 10, and then what happened psychologically in their adolescence. And they had, um, you know, uh, records of, of the, of the um, psychological problems. And this is sort of, how, this is sort of uh, the graph from the paper. That I, I don't expect you to read the graph, but I, you're just supposed to be impressed that they made graphs <laughs> and that they mapped it all. But the cool, the, the, there's two other refinements in this, in this publication that are pretty special. It's nice to reflect on when science is really well done. One is they analyzed this greenness effect separately for if you grew up in a city or you grew up in a provincial town or smaller. In other words, they asked the question, does being more green help you even if you grew up in a small town? Or does it only help you in a city? Because there's a lot of sort of uh, ad hoc stories out there, how schizophrenia, how there's all sorts of mental disorders that are you know, 100 or 200 percent higher in big cities. And th those have existed for a long time. But they wanted to ask the question, even in a provincial town, do you see it? So they analyzed it separately. And then they factored out, they factored out socioeconomic status and even mental health history. So they removed that. In other words, they included that and they adjusted it for that. So, so and then they asked what it did. What did the greenness do? Um, and the children who grew up with the lowest green space had 55% greater risk of developing um, psychiatric disorders as adolescents. That's a substantial increase in risk. That's after factoring out mental health history, socioeconomic status, and it holds for whether you grew up in a big, you know, a, a, a horrid gray city or even in a, in a village. And it didn't affect everything. It didn't affect intellectual, it didn't affect learning disabilities. There was no effect on learning disabilities or schizophrenic disorders. But for all the other ones, a significant effect. Isn't that amazing? This is not a small sample size. This is a very, very well done long-term study. You can only do this if you have good records, you know, really good records. We don't have good records here in the US, but it's still. It's, it's pretty astonishing. So um, the point to here is that, is that there's real value to having nature around us. And I think the science will keep getting better and better. I, I mean, I believe, I'm not supposed to admit this, but I believed this before the science came in from my personal experience, and I think many of you probably believed it. You know, but the science has been pretty weak. And we slowly build it up, and you'll see more and more. The other interesting thing that I, I didn't mention, about, they actually saw, and nobody has shown this before, uh, what is called a dose response curve. The bigger the dose of, 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 of greenness you got, the bigger response you got in terms of the reduction in the mental health. That's also kind of fascinating. And that, that's the first time anybody's ever done that. So, you know, we, I had a group. It, it, we, we were interested, I had a group of undergraduates do this research with me. We were interested in, because there's money, public money being spent on parks in Los Angeles, and asking 
just doing a study in going to parks and asking people what they liked about the parks and what type of nature they wanted. And I bring this up because uh, there was a real strong reaction that people really, really loved the parks and liked the nature. We also did it at DMV, which is a random sample, and they also liked it. But each culture and ethnicity had a different definition of what they liked. And the images, so these are the different parks we went to. And the images we would show them, we'd give them a choice. And we'd say, which of these would you choose? Now, a granola-eating Birkenstock hippie like I was, I would have always chose that top left corner, because that's wild nature. Uh, most people didn't choose that. But they, they did chose a, str a, a strong preference. And I think we have to think about this as we build our parks and cities. We, we, we have to let it be sort of respond to the local community and not go in and tell them, this is the nature you're going to get. And it's interesting, and that's why there's so much debate. I mean, they, you know, some of you may know about the debate around the Malibu Lagoon. And it's different visions of what a piece of, of nature should be. And, that, and you, that's going to happen with the LA River. That is going to happen with the LA River. It's not a, there's not a right answer. There's not a right answer. It's got to be this type of rest. There's not that right answer. It is a political, social discussion to have. The science tells you that there's a benefit to it, but it doesn't tell you that it has to be exactly like this. And that's going to be interesting. And we design nature all the time, just for agriculture's sake. You all, that's Imperial Valley. Look at that. I mean, talk about an engineered nature. That's, you know, it's a $2 billion, that just that value is a $2 billion a year industry. And so this notion of, res of restoration and designing nature Whereas conservation has so much been about, let's protect it as it is. And there's still a place for that. But the Anthropocene, the future, the happy future of the Anthropocene is about designing nature. And I'll end up by talking a little bit about the climate. This is overlap some with, with, with Jerry's remark. So we know there's a climate emergency. We know that. And, it's, and, and in the last year, the, the, all the data that Jerry was talking about, most of that's appeared in the last year. You wouldn't have said the same thing three years ago. It's in the last year, those papers, the accelerated sea level rise, the storms, the fire, it's just like, whoa. It's, it's like, you know, holy crap. You know, I'm not a doom and gloomer, but it's, you know, we've got that sense. And so one reaction to it, you know, the end of the world, Naomi Klein, this changes everything, capitalism versus the climate. That's not the right framing. That's the, you know, tear it down. That's not, the, that's not the right way to think about it. There's another narrative that has been in an undercurrent of a lot of the environmental movement, it's, and, it's, and it's sort of anti-technology. That's why the GMO, that's why uh, there, there, there's just sort of a fear of, te of technology. It's like there's what's, there's the free running Snake River and those dams where we spent several billion dollars re-engineering the dams so that they're better for fish, but it's not natural, you know, the, we, we have to reject that. So the, the, this anti-technology thing and this thing of all natural, those can't be part of the conversation. Neither of them can be. All natural and saying this is better because it's more natural, that shouldn't be part of the conversation saying something is, is preferred because it's low technology or high technology for that matter. That's not the, that's not the point. And car, you know, technology is going to be part of it. You already re referred to this. And at an amazing scale. So we're going to have to have carbon capture and storage. But the scale of it, this is just for the, the, this is for the things that suck it out of the air. And the scale of it for all those nodes in the area is just massive. And actually, there's no way we're going to get to that in time. But the other technology things is, Look, look at the technology things we're, we're exploring. That's lab meat. Um, and Memphis meats in Israel, we'll bring it to market first. It'll take off. We will have lab meat. Just like, you know, and, um, and it'll be, it'll be um, a great improvement in sort of water use and emissions. 
it's interesting. You, you know why Lab Meet will actually get accepted? Because I teach, I teach in high schools. It's because kids respond very favorably to it because you don't kill the animal. I think we realize that enough. That's a deep value. And all this, I mean, it's sold scientifically for uh, a different form of protein production to tackle this warming. But it actually, the market acceptance will be because of cruelty to animals. And I'm pretty, pretty confident of that. So there, there was a very famous article that was, came out about a year ago in the New York Magazine, two years ago, I guess. And uh, this was the opening. It is, I promise, worse than you think. That's Jerry, you know, right? Who would want to live with that man? I don't know. <laughs> really? I mean, it, uh, that's just also not a very good narrative. You know, it's, it's about a, vi you know, we have these choices between cities. I love the top picture. You know, that's, um, it's, and that's not to say, be Pollyannish and say it's going to be easy. It's, it's where the environment, what Jerry was referring to, all this innovation has to spill over into how we think about the environment. So that we're more, you know, we don't necessarily think the planet's fragile terribly. Every system's fragile. It has to go back to the way it was before Europeans came to North America and things like that. We're going to have to sort of loosen our grip on our vision for how we're going to have that environment. And this is the last thing, and then I'll give you my three prescriptions. And it really struck me as... When we worked for the Nature Conservancy, um, we had a good sense that our membership was, was aging. So the, I can't remember what the data are, but um, we were older than this room um, in terms of membership. And we, we felt that the future, we had to reach kids and we had to reach cities. So we, we had set up focus groups. And we did one in Oakland, we did Miami, um, New York, Atlanta, I'm not, it was like seven or eight cities, Denver. And it was, just, it was so fascinating. Um, we do these focus groups and we talk. This is one of the questions. And this is actually verbatim, but this came up over and over again. And these are focus groups primarily um, in um, minority communities because we also know de demographically already uh, whites are in the minority in California, but that's the way it's going to be for the whole country by 2050. So we'd say, I want you to imagine a person that cares about nature. Describe that person. Urban youth, that person is a girl. She wears a lot of green. She preaches about recycling. She is white and she has money. Moderator, is this person nice? Would you hang out with her? Urban youth, she is nice, but I would not invite her to a party. She is uptight. So we can't, that can't be the image of environmentalists. That just cannot be. That's Jerry. You know Jerry. It's got to be a different image. So let me end. He just told me I had to have these prescriptions for you. So I'll, I'll end with three things. I wrote them down because I don't want to. So, so what are three really concrete things to get this, this future of the Anthropocene? One, and I bet you I've convinced you of this, is we need to be investing in putting nature into our cities. So yes, densify, move into the cities, but make sure there's parks and there's access in, in some form or another, restored river, whatever, that we have access to. In another 10 years, the data are going to be so overwhelming. I think, you know, it's not just, we've only been the way we've been here for like four generations. We have 200,000 years where and you all know this. You, 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 you've all been out at night and felt a prickling on the back of your neck, right? You, you know what I'm talking about? There's a, the, like the hair stand up in the back of your neck, right? What is that? That's you as prey. That's you as prey. It's a physiological, you know, <laughs> response for you as prey. So, we, you know, we can't leave that nature behind. So we have to invest in it. It's part of our mental health. It's, it, it gives us joy. You know, and you can get it at an aquarium. You can even get it at a get it at zoos and stuff. It's 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 the surprise of an animal and a creature. But it's, it, and you know we'll only discover it. So that's one. Invest in giving everyone access to it in cities because we're all going to live in cities. 
The second thing is we have to recognize that the future is a wedding of technology and nature. And the two are different fields right now. Most people who are trained in environmentalists don't know any engineering. Um, and that's a mistake. And I saw that in, you know, I worked, we, one of the projects I worked on when I was at TMC, and it's still going on, is we were working on using like oyster reefs and restored wetlands to, redu to reduce storm surge and hurricanes. And of course, the reinsurance companies and the hard infrastructures for seawalls and levees also have their models. And their models are proprietary, and we didn't have any access to the data, but they had better data than us. And so we formed a collaboration and did this. But they modeled the ocean floor and the coast as though it was just a flat surface like it was a parking lot. You know, they didn't have any habitat in it. And that's the environmental tradition and the engineering tradition coming up and not being creative. Because as it, when you're creative, yes, sometimes you do need the seawalls and you do need that, but sometimes the marshes and the wetlands can do it. And you can't have these different traditions of, of the technical and the natural. The, half, the, the science has to merge, that's number two. And the third one is, is really about this. It's, you have to change the narrative. The narrative of denial, stop, tear down, remove. In some cases, resistance is right. And you do that. But it also has to have a vision of creativity and trying things and new things, creating a new type of nature. And so we have to change the narrative so that you're fun at a party. That's it. Thanks. So I'm glad to take questions. Thank you.